U.S. Naval Academy Professor Wayne Shea, West Pointers in the Civil War is the name of your book. The Old Army in War and Peace is the subtitle. First of all, what do you mean by the Old Army? Uh, the Old Army is a, a term commonly used by historians. Actually, it's, it's a term from the time period, really referring to the regular army, the Indian fighting army. Uh, there's a joke that the Old Army is the, the army before every war. So there's a bunch of new Old Army. So my, my book actually starts uh, really with the professionalization of the American regular army right after the War of 1812 ends. So it's about how that process occurs in, in the old army and how that plays out in the Civil War. So well, so give, us a, give us a snapshot of what the old army prior to the War of 1812 was like. The old army, um, oh, well, before the War of 1812, uh, and this is drawing on really historical literature by, by historians such as William Skelton, is that the, the, the army before the War of 1812 is a very, we call it, non-professional. Its officer corps is mostly uh, obtains their positions through political influence. It's part of a sort of the American political patronage system. And as a consequence, they're not, because they are not professionals who, um, who went through a body of education and, and, and were promoted by some system of merit, uh, they don't perform very well during the War of 1812. So Washington, D.C. is burned. Uh, the early attempts to invade Canada don't go very well. They're all catastrophes. Uh, it's my impression the Canadians, you know, look at War of 1812 very differently. <laughs> Partly, you know, sort of a great victory of repelling American invaders. Um, and so, after the War of 1812, uh, you have a big movement that starts during the war, a realization that there needs to be a a more systematic way of selecting and preparing uh, officers to be to be to be um, in the army to be commanders, basically. Who spearheaded that change after 1812? Um, uh, the crucial figure in many ways of this is Winfield Scott. Um, who is a wonderful figure because he's, his career be begins before the War of 1812, astonishingly enough, and extends right until the opening of the Civil War when he finally retires. Uh, but he, Jacob Brown, there, there are a few other officers, uh, but Scott is the most important. They, they become uh, very much, their agenda very much is uh, to build a profes proper professional institutions and to take expertise, usually European, usually French, and bring it to the United States. So um, another major figure of this would be Sylvanus Thayer, uh, who was sent on a mission to France, basically, to collect information about military education. Uh, he, he collects huge numbers of books and material. He comes back to West Point, and with the support of people like Scott, Scott is a, becomes a prominent general during the War of 1812. He is able to uh, systematize the West Point curriculum and the West Point experience in a way that hadn't been the case before. Um, when was West Point founded? 1802. Uh, and but it's it it always uh, I think historians still argue about what Thomas Jefferson was really after uh, when when the when the school was founded, but the what no one disagrees that the school is institutionally weak. It's sort of unclear what the purpose of the of the institution is. There's not very systematized instruction. There's widely divergent ages, for example, of cadets, some much older, some much younger, and. Uh, to this day at West Point, they still call Thayer the sort of the father of West Point because he's the one who puts it on much much sounder and more systematic institutional footing. And that's very important uh, for because that's the army that will produce the generals uh, of the Civil War. Is that institution, West Point, is going to be what where where all these most of these most Civil War generals get their initial professional experience. Well, Professor Shea, you uh, the title is West Pointers and the Civil War. Who are some of the West Pointers who we've heard of that were generals in the Civil War on both sides? Uh, generally, in all honesty, most of the famous ones. I mean, Sherman, uh, Grant, Lee, Hood, um, uh, you know, all about, to give you a harder number, um, there are, some, I mean, there are a few famous non-West Pointers, uh, uh, Wade Hampton, for example, but there, there really are a few. Stonewall Jackson's a West Pointer. Uh, to give you a sense of the numbers, two-thirds of, of major generals and above, two-star generals and above, are veterans, at least of the regular army. And the regular army really is dominated by West Point. So the West Point's about, um, uh, it's not only that most officers in the regular army are graduates of West Point, it's that it's kind of the focal point of much of the army's professionalism. So when they do, for example, review boards for things like new tactics, they'll a lot of times use the cadets as guinea pigs. And they'll be, they'll be, uh, they'll go to West Point and use them and have them march around. And they'll use the West Point Library because military knowledge is rather scarce in the United States. So the West Point has a very, has the most thorough library available. So it becomes kind of the place where a lot of this stuff is done. But 
you know, if we think of the the big three, Lee, Grant, Sherman, or more than the big three, I guess, Stonewall, Jackson, these builder uh, Longstreet, they're all West Pointers. They all know each other in the regular army. They all have gone through that experience. So when it comes down to the Civil War, you've got generals on the south, generals on the, the north who have been trained in the same ways. What, what does that do to some of the conflicts? Um, for me, the, the most important thing that happens, uh, the most important end result of that is that the wars are fighting essentially clones of each other in a sense. Because their leadership models, uh, their experiences are similar. What happens is that the, the armies are locked in a, you know, I call it an equilibrium of competence. They're basically, since they're fighting mirror images of one another, that's part of what causes the war to last as long as it does. To be, we sometimes, in military historians sometimes describe it as being indecisive, meaning that the war doesn't end in 61 with one giant battle, first bull run. It doesn't end in 62, it doesn't end in 63. It, it takes until 1865, and it's a long process. And it's partly because the armies, since they start out with very similar institutional models, they learn, therefore, at, at similar rates. Um, so they both get much better, uh, but they get better at about the same pace. So you can still have uh, battlefield decisions. You can obviously the North wins, but but the. A lot of times in, in military history, when you see the big spectacular victory, something like Napoleon in you know, Yalerstadt, where he destroys the entire Prussian army at one blow, you have to have not just superior generalship, you also usually have to have superior organization institutions. So during the Civil War, you'll have superior generalship. There are clearly better generals and there are worse generals. But since the institutions are similar, the advantage they can get at each engagement, at a Chancellorsville, right? that's a great example. Lee has a crushing victory at Chancellorsville, but he can't quite truly destroy the entire federal army, uh, partly because these armies are so similar, at, at such a similar level of competence and, and proficiency. So d was one of the goals of, of every uh, of these big battles that we fought, was one of the goals uh, a, an end-all yes. type? Yes. Focus. Yes, this we're is. We're going to end the war here. We're yeah, I mean, that's the win hope. Win the war here. That really is the hope. Um, and, and was that taught? At West Point, was that type of strategy it, taught? You know, one thing, one of the curious ironies about this is that West Point is is, and this is part of the problem because West Point is because of Thayer's influence by this French model of military engineering education. West Point doesn't teach much strategy. It teach it's what West Point teaches is that how, cadets how to be junior officers. It's like the service academies to this day. We we prepare our midshipmen not to be admirals immediately. We prepare them to be ensigns and second lieutenants. And, uh, and West Point gives those cadets that basic grounding and the most basic fundamental building box of military expertise. And it gives them a lot of engineering, probably more than they really need, in all honesty. Um, so the desire for a, a big decisive battle really comes from more of a cultural affinity for Napoleon. This sense of, I mean, Napoleon has this, McClellan is likened to Napoleon early in his career. He at times strikes a Napoleonic pose. And it's, it's people reading kind of popular history books that, that glorify Napoleon because there are wars where, of course, I mean, the, the irony is in the end Napoleon loses, but he, there are these battles where he's, he has these crushing, decisive victories where at least that segment of the Napoleonic Wars ends. And that is, in many ways, the model of what, what most West Point generals um, are hoping to achieve. Uh, uh, especially early in the war. And later in the war, this becomes increasingly problematic, and you have people like Sherman who come up with sort of interesting alternative visions. Uh, but, but for much of the public and much of the, the Army's officer corps on both sides, there is a desire that w if you can get it, that's what you want, which is you want to completely destroy your opponents in the field, not just make them retreat, and not just inflict more casualties than, than you suffer, but to actually crush them as a, as a, as a formal organization. So, Professor Xia, what about counterinsurgency and insurgency methods? Were those adapted during the Civil War? Uh, who were some of the more, um, those that maybe broke out of the mold of their training at West there, Point? There, there are definitely guerrillas, um, and, and they are especially vexatious for um, Union military logistics. Uh, but the problem with guerrillas for the Confederates, really, and, and this, is, it's, this is an issue that's definitely gotten more interest. And I would say that some of that interest has comes from recent American um, issues overseas, for lack of a better way of putting it. I, I would say, though, that it, it would be a mistake to overstate the influence of, 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 of uh, guerrillas, partly because the conf guerrillas can 
deny conventional military forces control of a piece of territory. They can harass logistics.